Good evening and happy Halloween. And welcome to the Township of Woolwich Special Council meeting here on October 31st, 2022. We are now live on YouTube. I will now do a roll call of council. I, Councilor Redekop, am present and chairing this meeting. Councilor Martin. Present. Councilor McMillan. Present. Councilor Merlihan. Present. Councilor Shantz. Present. Thank you very much. Mayor Shantz is not able to attend the meeting this evening and sends her regrets. Um, I need a resolution to uh, reconvene an open session. Is there a mover and a seconder? Councillor Martin, seconded by Councillor McMillan. All those in favor? Thank you very much. Please join me in observing a moment of silence. Thank you very much. Now that our land acknowledgement that we say every meeting and every committee meeting of the Township of Woolwich, land on which we meet has been here from time immemorial. People have inhabited Southern Ontario for about 10,000 years, and we acknowledge the neutral people also called the Adirondaran and the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee people who lived here when settlers arrived and who share this land with us. May we together learn to care for and respect each other, our flora and fauna, and the land we inhabit together. Is there any disclosures of pecuniary interest this evening? Uh, Councillor Merlihan, go ahead. Uh, you know, through you, um, I have a pecuniary interest uh, with the uh, report 8.1 uh, regarding uh, Woods and Clemens addition. Uh, Woods and Clemens and there's actually a bunch of other names uh, associated with Woods and Clemens that are just not on the tip of my head, but anyway, they are a client. Uh, with 9.2, um, the tube line report, uh, Brian L. Schantz, uh, who's representing them, is a client. Okay, thank you very much. I don't see anyone else. Uh, there's no items to come forward from closed session. The adoption of our minutes of our last meeting, that the following minutes be adopted as presented the special council minutes of October 3rd, 2022. Seeing no, uh, Councillor Schantz, go ahead. Okay, moved as seconded by Councillor McMillan. All those in favor? Sorry, I can't vote. Sorry about that. Thanks, it's passed. Uh, number eight on our agenda is a public meeting. We have two, we have two planning reports for the planning public meeting this evening. Before we begin, I read the following. The following portion of the meeting is for information only and no decisions will be made tonight. Any questions can be directed to development services staff following the meeting. I declare the planning public meeting to be open. The first one is a, a information report of zone change application for eight Memorial uh, Avenue in Elmira. First up this evening, we have planner David Gundrum to provide an overview of his report. Go, turn your microphone and video on, David. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor and Chair Redekop. Um, my apologies if my video may lag uh, during my presentation. I'm experiencing some bandwidth issues, but I'll keep it on uh, just so that it's there. Uh, to provide an overview, uh, the following uh, zone change application uh, concerns property municipally addressed as 9 Memorial Avenue uh, in the town of Elmira. Uh, Witzel Dice Engineering has applied on behalf of the Memorial Avenue properties for this zone change concerning a 0.16 hectare, 0.4 acre property located at 9 Memorial Avenue. Uh, the property is designated as a core area in the township's official plan and is currently zoned both C2 and R5 in the township zoning bylaw. Uh, the property currently contains a two-story dwelling of approximately 149 square meters or 1,600 square feet, uh, which is currently utilized as a law office. Uh, the subject property is bounded to the west by Memorial Avenue, uh, to the east by a residential dwelling in the R5 zone, and also abuts residential dwellings to the north and south, uh, which are currently zoned for commercial use in the C2 zone. Based on the concept that has been received, by, uh, by the township from the applicants. 
Uh, the site is proposed to be developed with a two-story addition of approximately 220 square meters uh, or 2,400 square feet as, a, an, as an expansion to the existing law office use. As well, uh, the rear portion or rear half of the property to the east is proposed to be developed with an outdoor surfaced parking area, which would contain 16 off-street parking spaces, inclusive of one accessible parking space. Uh, the zone change application proposes to migrate the current R5 zoning of the rear portion of the property uh, to the C2 zone to permit the proposed outdoor parking area that would be accessory to the expanded uh, law office use. Uh, in support of the application, the ap applicants have submitted a scaled site plan, uh, which is contained on page 12 of the agenda, as well as a planning justification report that addresses applicable planning policies. Uh, so that is a summary of the proposal and the concept perceived uh, that is being considered under, under the zoning change uh, uh, for public consideration tonight. Uh, thank you, and I'll turn it back over to the chair. Thank you for your report. Uh, before we hear from the registered participant, does council have any questions for Mr. Gundram? Seeing none, we will go to the registered participant. We will now hear from uh, Richard Gerson. Mr. Gerson, you may turn on your video and microphone on and begin when you are ready. Uh, okay. I'm uh, attempting to share my screen so I can, oh, there it is, okay. Thank you for this opportunity to uh, address the proposal. Um, uh, okay, I think we have the technology working. Uh, Mayor and Council, um, Acting Mayor, thank you for the, this opportunity. Um, my concern for this change in land use is that there are no details of the landscaping, fencing, or lighting for the proposed gravel parking lot. And this is a parking lot that is surrounded on three sides by residential dwellings. Following reading the application documents and talking with the township planner, my understanding is that the zone change for the subject property is a public process with the subsequent site plan to be an internal process between the applicant and township planning staff. As a nearby property owner participating in the zone change is the only opportunity to comment on the proposed change in the use of this property. Page 12 of the application has the comment that site plan approval would be also be required as well. At this time, the site plan application has not been filed as it could be considered premature until the necessary amendment has advanced to a level where favorable consideration may be given to the project. As the neighbors, a site plan, uh, for the neighbors, a site plan is essential, not premature. For the 48 years I have lived on or near this property, it's been a garden. At this time, it's grassed with an existing grapevine and current bushes in the center. I have some photos to show you. Um, it's lots 59 and 60 looking west from towards the existing law office. On the right, you can see the grapevines. In the center is the law office and the current parking lot. And on the left, you can see um, a multiple unit, unit dwelling with a fence. This is uh, further north on the property. Behind the grapevines are some current bushes and you can see the parking lot in the distance. Converting these lots into a barren gravel lot would have a changed and negative impact on all the surrounding residential areas. This may be ameliorated based on an appropriate site plan. That plan is unknown. I can understand the separation of these two steps. My concern is that the change land use is developed with proper landscaping and lighting consistent with the surrounding residential accommodations and living units. To the north of the subject property, there's two residential lots that are impacted, two further residences to the east, and at the south of the consolidated lands is the 16 unit apartment building. In total, 20 living units abut the subject property. The entire, entire south side of these lands is enclosed by a chain, chain link fence, approximately two meters in height. 
page 40 of, of the application states, a wooden privacy fence should be provided to delineate the limits of the parking area, provide security and provide a buffer screening to abutting residential land uses. Adding additional fencing to the south would be inappropriate as this existing large chain link fence is there already. So here's a photo showing uh, from the north of the subject property to the south. You can see the chain link fence near the 16 Mr. Goodson, apartment sorry, block. Sorry, hey, um, we can't see, we can, your, your screen isn't being shared. Do you want us to share the pictures? I am attempting to share the screen. Um, but I, can we do it? Yeah, we can do it. So just wait, hold on a minute and we'll put up your pictures. Okay. Okay. It's just sharing the screen. They're part of the slideshow. Yeah. Yeah, we weren't able to see what you were sharing. Okay, can you see that, Mr. Gerson? Um, well, it, it, I'm, I'm able to see what's on my screen, but I'm not what's on your screen. Okay, it's the first. It's the first photo that you that is in. Uh, is in okay, our... here's the first photo. Okay, go ahead. Uh, this is looking from the eastern side of the property, the subject property, towards the law office. Okay. On the right, you can see grapevines. On the left, you can see a chain link fence. And uh, the law office has an existing parking lot. The next photo shows uh, behind the grapevines, there are some current bushes. And as I've proceeded down, um, I have a, two more photos. This is one of the chain link fence, about two meters in height. And here's a second photo showing uh, the fence going along the south side of the property. And you can see the law office in the rear. Uh, lighting, uh, flood lighting is currently used to illuminate the current parking lot at the rear of Nine Memorial. This is on throughout the night. The requirement for one tree for each five parking spaces, a total of 3.2 trees for 16 spaces already exists with the trees and large shrubs now growing on the south property line. Proper landscaping and hedging to mark the limits of lots 59 and 60 with lighting, if any, to be turned off following business hours would be appropriate for the surrounding residences. I would also note on page four of the pre-consultation report, there are the following statements. It's our understanding, this is in quotes, that a completed application to the township and region will include the following, completed application form, application fees, proposed site plan, planning opinion report, draft proposed zoning bylaw. The absence of the proposed site plan would make this application incomplete. Everything else uh, is, is present. And uh, that's the end of my presentation. I'm prepared for any questions or comments. Thank okay, you. Thank you, Mr. Gerson. And thank you to Alex for making that possible. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions for Mr. Gerson? Seeing none, thank you again, Mr. Gerson. And you can turn your uh, audio and video off. Thank you. Thank you. I will now ask the clerk if there are any unregistered participants in the meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, there are no unregistered uh, participants for this uh, item. Okay, so this ends this portion of the public meeting. We'll go on to the next one, which is an information report on the official plan amendment application for 21 Arthur Street North, Elmira Trinity uh, United Church. We will now hear from our manager of planning, Jeremy Vink, for an overview of his report. Go ahead, Jeremy, when you're ready. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, members of council. So this is a zone change application uh, 9, 2022 and official plan amendment number 4, 2022 for the Trinity United Church. So uh, GSP has submitted this application on behalf of the church. The application pertains to two properties of 0.136 hectares. Uh, one parcel is the 21 Arthur Street North, which contains the church and associated parking and is zoned commercial with uh, C1 with site specific. 
provisions. The other portion is for Cross Street, which contains a single detached dwelling, um, which is zoned residential high density R-5. And for Cross Street is behind 21 Arthur Street North. And they are interconnected at the rear lot lines. The applicants are proposing to amend the official plan and zoning bylaw to facilitate the construction of a five-story mixed-use building. The ground floor would be for, would be for the uh, church and worship area, as well as one uh, residential unit associated with the church. The three floors above that would be for residential purposes, and then the top floor would be a rooftop amenity area, um, amenity space for the for the business uh, build, building for the residential units. In total, they're proposing 40 residential units, 25 one bedroom and 15 two bedroom units at this point of time. And parking is to be provided at the uh, surface level, both underneath, the, underneath the, the second story of the building as well as just on the surface on the, and to the rear of the site. The official plan amendment is to increase the residential density from 120 units per hectare to 127 units per hectare to allow for the 40 units. And the proposed zone, zoning amendment is to rezone the entire parcel to commercial C1, core commercial C1 with site specific provisions to allow for the church um, as a place of worship, as well as the mixed use building to increase the maximum height of the building from 10.5 to 18.1 meters and to reduce the required parking for a place of worship with a sanctuary and 40 dwelling units from the required 83 parking spaces down to 57 parking spaces. The applicant has submitted a number of documents in support of the application. Those are listed in the in the plan, in the report, and can be reviewed online on the township's webpage. Yeah, staff is available for any questions or comments if necessary. But the applicant is also here to speak to the proposal before you tonight. Well, before we go to the consultants, uh, does any of members of council have questions for Mr. Vink on this uh, official plan amendment application? Councillor Merlihan. Go ahead. Thank you. Through you to Mr. Vink. Uh, I had a call from a resident uh, today about the parking. I was just wondering if you could uh, explain that. You just talked about 83 spaces down to 57. Uh, the concern uh, from a nearby resident was uh, the uh, the church uh, capacity. Um, they, you know, have lived there for many years, and uh, during church time, usually the parking lot at Freiburgers. Uh, kind of fills up. And I guess there's a number of different um, congregations now that are, are using Trinity United. Uh, so if, could you explain, uh, I guess, where where alternative parking would be if there's uh, not enough uh, on site? Uh, yes, through you, Mr. Chair, to Councillor Merlihan. So um, they are proposing to kind of share some of the parking as in the parking justification that was provided. And I'll try to explain it because it is a bit of a complex scenario that they've outlined. Uh, essentially, they're, assume, they're associating one space per unit to the residential units, so for the 40. And then there's about 10 shared spaces that during the week would be used for visitors to the residential as well as maybe a bit for the church. <clears throat> excuse me, but and on Sundays, those 10 spaces would be dedicated to the church amongst a few other spaces. So there'll be 17 or so dedicated towards the church on Sundays. The church uh, by calculation requires 23 spaces in total uh, by our parking calculation. So that makeup of parking would have to happen, of course, if there was extra parking beyond uh, obviously what's required, they would happen on street and it wouldn't be on the Freiburger property necessarily unless they made arrangements, but it'd be on street parking, uh, such as we have in the downtown, um, you know, just where commercial uses kind of utilize so up and down the street on either William or Arthur, that type of thing, maybe even cross street. So they'd be utilizing street parking. Okay, and just as a follow up, what would the capacity of the church, uh, like how many people would that hold? Uh, I don't recall off the top of my head. I think it's about a, just over 100 and some odd people. That's where it came out to the parking calculation. I think it's 23 spaces. Um, just about 115, 120, I think is the, is the number it's holding. If I recall, the consultant can correct me, but it's about a, just over 100 people. Okay, maybe they'll, maybe they'll explain further yeah. uh, during their delegation. Thank you for that information. Yeah. Any other questions for Jeremy? Seeing none, uh, we have consultants on the application, Valerie Schmidt, 
Greg Latimer and uh, Alex Brogantz, or is that Riley Williams, maybe? Both, all, okay, thank you. With that, they all are with us this evening to provide counsel with an overview of the applications. All of you may turn your videos and microphones on and begin when you are ready. Good evening, Chair, members of council. I do have just a brief presentation to share that just provides a, a little more detail to, to the application. Can everyone see that? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, great. So um, my name is Valerie Schmidt. I am from GSP Group. And along with me as part of the consultant team and also present tonight is uh, Greg Latimer and Ian Huff from Studio Canoe. They provide the architectural services for this project. And as well, I think on the line is Alex Brogantz. So, so as you're aware, the owner of the site is proposing a five-story mixed-use building. And that includes the amenity space on the roof. The ground floor of the building is proposed to accommodate worship, an office, meeting and kitchen space for the Trinity United Church, as well as one residential unit on the ground floor. So the remaining three upper stories are proposed for residential use. And the final, the final story is proposed for indoor and outdoor amenity space. So in total, there's 40 residential units being proposed along with the 57 parking spaces. And that's contained within surface parking as well as at grade parking within the first floor. So that would be this area right here, if you can see, see the little hand there. So this is the overall um, site plan. And this kind of illustrates the proposed building as well as the parking area. Um, as well as pedestrian connections and the landscaping features that are being proposed. So with this proposal, both the existing church and the dwelling will be demolished. Um, from the site plan, you can note that the building is fronting onto Arthur Street with connections to Arthur as well as Cross Street. So as Jeremy indicated, you know, the lands are designated Township Urban Growth Center in the region's official plan. It's further designated core area in the Township official plan. In the Township official plan, they per permit a maximum net residential density of 120 units um, per net residential hectare. So based on the 40 residential units, the proposed development has a density of 127 units. So that is why we need the official plan amendment in order to facilitate this development. Um, also discussed, um, the current zoning on the property will not facilitate the proposed development. Um, the zoning bylaw is required to rezone the site to a core commercial. Um, zone with site specific provisions and as mentioned earlier the site specific provisions are just requesting to permit the worship as a permitted use in the mixed use building just to increase the building height to 18.1 meters as well as to reduce um, the parking requirements. Um, this graphic just illustrates the site and just noting that it's in the downtown core area of Elmira where buildings are generally commercial on the bottom with residential on the top. Um, the proposed um, church use is still compatible with the surrounding area and just as a note it has existed on the site since 1870. Um, the proposed development will provide a more affordable housing choices for residents in Elmira. Perhaps it also will provide residents an opportunity to downsize but remain in the core. Um, given the location of the site, it's very close to amenities within walking distance as well as opportunities to be close to public transit. The overall design of the building has taken into consideration the protection of privacy by elimin eliminating balconies and then providing that common amenity space on the rooftop. The size will also incorporate, um, the site's also gonna incorporate landscaping and a buffer around the perimeter to minimize any impacts to adjacent properties. Um, we did connect, we did, as part of uh, our submission, we did do a shadow analysis and the results indicate 
six hours of sunlight to maintain. Um, and this is in particular to the property at 25 Arthur, which is immediately adjacent to the site, um, which would have the most impact to them. But you know, most municipalities consider five hours of sunlight um, a general accepted level. Uh, we're actually ensuring that there's more sunlight protection than that. This is just a conceptual landscape plan, and this just illustrates the landscaping areas as well of where proposed fencing is going to be um, provided. You can see that there's slightly larger buffers that have been provided in areas um, adjacent to existing residential properties. And just briefly, these are the shadowing, um, the shadow study results or the graphics. Um, and they're just showing the impacts to the proposed development during spring, summer, and fall at various times during the day. And as noted earlier, um, you can see this property over here will be impacted the most um, during the different seasons, but overall they're still providing um, more than the minimum and providing at least six hours of sunlight on that property. So you can just see where the shadows will be going during those different seasons. So that just concludes our presentation and brief overview. Our consultant team is here and we are happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much for your report. Uh, is there any questions for any of the consultants that are here on behalf of the you know, Trinity United Church? Councillor Merlihan, go ahead. Thank you through you um, to any of the consultants. Uh, I previously asked a question uh, to Mr. Vink about uh, parking uh, that came through a resident. Uh, I was wondering if you could explain um, what happens on those days, uh, on well, particularly Sunday, when there are uh, congregants uh, that show up. Uh, apparently it holds 123 people and there are 23 parking spots dedicated. So I, I'm just wondering the rationale that uh, um, your report, uh, if you could speak to that. Uh, yeah. Parking. <clears throat> Go ahead, Valerie. Yeah. Thank you. I'm happy um, to comment on, uh, on that as well. Yeah. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that the sanctuary is designed for 70 seats. Correct. Okay. Okay. And then with respect to parking, we have had some initial dialogue with um, the township. And we do believe that we can come it's still a work in process on how the spots will be um, designated or distributed, but I do think that there's going to be a good outcome where we are, are going to be able to provide, um, you know, 1.25 units per uh, per residential unit, and then I think we can work on doing some shared parking as well as maybe some um, off street parking as well. I don't know if my, the consultant team has anything else to add. Yeah, no, I would just say um, our, our, our traffic parking consultant wasn't able to attend tonight. So she's briefed us on, on the specifics of her report, but essentially the existing church has 18 spaces. Um, the, uh, the, the amount of seating in the new church will uh, likely be less than the existing situation. And our initial proposal, which Valerie mentioned is, in, being um, discussed with the township right now is that we would provide them with seven permanent spaces and there, there would be 10 floating spaces that could either be used as visitor parking for the residents during the week or uh, for the church on Sundays during services. So that would be a total of 17. So we're actually only one space short of the current condition. Um, there is on-street parking and, and other kind of outlets that, uh, the uh, churchgoers use currently, and um, there's no reason to suspect that that relationship would change in the future moving forward. So that's our general approach, but um, we are discussing it with uh, with uh, Jeremy Vink ongoing. Okay. In general, I would just like to say um, as well, I mean, this is the kind of density that um, promotes a walkable downtown. So really we're relying on residents not using their cars as well. Um, uh, there's some thought that um, the congregants may actually live in the building. So um, um, 
in general, um, increasing the walkability of the downtown core is a, an important aspect of, of this project. And I think it, it kind of ties in with the provincial policy on this matter as well. Other than that, I, I think Jeremy described our, our building quite well, but we're happy to answer any other questions from the councillors. Any other questions to the consultants? Councillor Merlihan, go ahead. Yeah, thank you through you. Um, the resident uh, that reached out to me this afternoon uh, wanted to, I guess, wanted to understand the rationale between behind uh, providing so many one bedroom uh, apartments and two bedroom apartments and not having um, more than that to accommodate families and, and such. I'm wondering if you could just uh, explain your rationale. Uh, she'll be uh, tuning into the meeting uh, at some point uh, tonight or tomorrow. So uh, you might as well give her the answer right from, from you guys. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, well, I mean, the current mix is kind of um, uh, an early take on it. Uh, obviously, there has to be a little more market research to see what people actually want. I would say, I know that there was one question from a, a resident, perhaps her, about why there weren't more three bedrooms. Now, in our current unit mix, we have um, uh, three units per floor that are more than a thousand square feet and two units per floor that are about around 950 square feet. Um, we haven't done detailed unit plans, but those areas could potentially accommodate three bedroom units or two bedroom plus den. So uh, we have a fair bit of flexibility in terms of the final unit layout, but um, right now we're just focused on the overall feasibility of, of this project in terms of the site. And we would be working through that level of detail as we've moved forward through a site planning uh, process. And uh, are, are there a type of clientele that you're targeting with this uh, project? Um, well, I think I'd let uh, um, Alex Brigantz or um, no, I'm happy to one of that. the church members speak to that specifically. Yeah, I think we mainly were looking from the beginning, uh, something which could uh, serve um, 50 plus um, somebody who wants to retire and just kind of downsize. And as already been mentioned, we, we're hoping to bring the same members of uh, congregation back to the same building. So, um, and we also, as Greg mentioned, we're still doing research and kind of playing with the building layout. So, but uh, we kind of, we look at different sectors, but so far 50 plus, um, and might be young families part of it as well. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for the consultants this evening? Seeing none, uh, thank you very much for your input and uh, uh, we'll probably be hearing, council will be hearing from you again. Uh, we will now hear from a registered participant, Cheryl Fisher. You may turn your video and microphone on and begin when you're ready. Hi, thank you, uh, Chair Redikoff and Councillors. Um, I've been obviously following this project as well. I was also part of the um, survey uh, that and I was involved in the downtown urban plan and, and all the work that's gone into a lot of, um, of changes and revitalization of what we want to do to our downtown core. I live a block away from this proposal and I have lived um, majority of my life, actually over 50 years, I've lived a block away from the downtown and I've chosen to do that. And I'm looking at this project and I'm seeing something amazing happening downtown. And I'm just here to say that having a facility where people can walk to where they wanna go, um, have a transit, the community bus goes right by this building, the GRT is a block away, the Route 21 out of the city. This is the kind of thing that I wanna see. This is the kind of thing that I wanna be able to move into one day, because I'm a block away from where I've spent the majority of my life. Um, I'm at the age where my friends, parents, they want to move, but they're saying there's nothing for us here. So they're looking at more market valued apartments in Waterloo and Kitchener. And I'm saying, hey, like, just wait, let's see what Woolwich is going to do downtown Elmira. What are we going to do with, with you, the United Church property? What are we going to do with the Riverside Drive School? What can we do to get people walking. I, I, we're, I'm a one car household. I've chosen to be that for over 25 years. I walk everywhere uptown to do what I need to do. And that's why, um, 
that's why I'm, I've chosen to speak today, just to say what I've chosen to do and what I'd love for other people to be able to have. Um, and let's let's get our downtown busy, revitalized. And this is a project that um, that is definitely a step in the right direction. So I just wanted to input that as a lifetime resident living in this neighborhood. Thank you, Ms. Fisher. Is there any comments or questions from uh, Councillor McMillan? Go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chair Redekop. Uh, through you, I just want to say uh, thank you to Cheryl for saying all the things that I would have said in my comments if I could have found a way to pose them as a question. Um, as a fellow downtown resident, uh, I, I think that your comments are, are bang on and, and you took the words right out of my mouth. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions for the uh, participant? Uh, seeing none, thank you very much, Ms. Fisher. You, you may turn your video and microphone off and again, thank you for coming. We will now hear from the registered partition participant, sorry, Peter Kipfer or Kupfer, chair of the Trinity Development Committee. Mr. Kupfer, you may turn your video and microphone on and begin when you are ready. Thank you, Chair uh, Kupfer, counselors and planners. Uh, my name is Peter Kupfer and I'm chair of the Trinity Development Committee. Thank you for allowing me to give a quick outline of our vision for the community as to our redevelopment of Trinity United Church. It is our hope the downtown Elmira centerpiece of church space for worship, rental apartments, and community space for use of the community. The congregation along with myself and our dedicated members have diligently for well over 10 years resource all possible uses for the community. We hope to be able to provide space, 40 market rent units with the uh, hope that churches and community organizations will subsidize some of the units for people in need of assistance in housing. We are anticipating this process of getting approvals to move forward the development with expediency as we would really would like to have the development ready to accomplish our goal by the fall of 2024. We are grateful for everything the township will do to enable our congregation to continue our mission to live, learn, and love Christ's teachings. Thank you and to your approvals and recommendations to Woolwich Council to move forward with our mission and mission. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, is, are there any questions for the registered participant? Yes. Mr. Kipfer, uh, Councillor Schantz, go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, through you to Mr. Kupfer. Um, not really a question, but a comment. Um, although I won't be around for the final decision, I wanna thank the Trinity United Church for their vision in sharing the, their place of worship and redeveloping this project. If this project goes through, it will offer opportunity for Elmira residents uh, to be able to downsize and stay right in their community. And it's nice to hear that there might be an affordable housing aspect to it as well. So I just want to wish you good luck with your project. Thanks for coming. Thank, thank you. you. Any other comments or questions? I see lots of nods. So thank you again for this project. And we, we want to see it uh, come to fruition as soon as possible. Um, thank you. Uh, you may turn your microphone off and your video off. I will now ask Clerk Smith if there are any unregistered participants in the meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chair. There are no unregistered participants for uh, this item as well. Thank you, Clerk Smith. There being no further speakers, I declare the planning public meeting to be closed. We move on to number nine of our agenda, delegations. Before we begin our delegations this evening, I'll read the following instructions for our delegates. You have a maximum of seven minutes to speak unless council or the clerk has set a different time. There will be a timer on the screen and you will hear a warning when you have one minute left and when your time is up. Once you are finished, please wait for questions of clarification from council. When there are no more questions for you, please turn your microphone and camera off again. You may listen to the rest of the meeting or leave when you want. Council discussion and debate will start when all questions of clarification have finished. 
The first uh, 9.1 delegate, Murray Haight from Kiwanis Club of Elmira for a request for an exemption of a special event permit fee for Kiwanis Santa Claus Parade. Welcome to the meeting, Mr. Haight. Please turn your microphone on and video on and begin when you are ready. Good evening, Acting Mayor and members of council. Uh, the annual Kiwanis Santa Claus Parade is an important event in our community as witnessed by the throngs of persons who line both sides of the main street. Last year's event was no exception, even in the face of uh, severe health restrictions. This year's event is expected to be just as successful. Organizing and running a parade is expensive. Major cost items include the bands, each of which is an integral component if the parade is to be at all successful. Other expenses include the purchasing of candy. Uh, for that, this year we are purchasing prepackaged uh, candy and the handlers will be masked and gloved. Promoting the parade is another expense. Then there are the various fees. The special event permit fee, while not excessive, is an expense to be covered. In addition, this year, the police presence, which in the past has been provided at no charge, must cover the cost of three police officers, three police vehicles for a minimum of three hours. And plus their uh, administration fees. So the question is, where do the funds come from to cover the costs? Some of the funds are collected as entry fees and as sponsorships. Our Kiwanis Club is then responsible for covering any shortfalls. So why am I here? As I said before, while the special event permit fee in and of itself is not perhaps overwhelming, it is one area where assistance by council can help us out, both financially and by contributing with the township's endorsement of this special event. I hope that you are able to grant our request and I look forward to seeing you at the parade. The parade date, December the 3rd, the time, the parade starts at 10 a.m. And one final comment I wish to make is one of extending our appreciation to all the staff in the council and, and at the yard works who assist us with various ways. In particular, thanks go to the crew out on the, who helped carry out the uh, traffic barriers and after the parade, collect them. I would be pleased to answer any questions should they arise, thank you. Are there any questions for the delegation? Comments? Councillor Merlihan, go ahead. Uh, how much is the fee? Uh, $200, right? Is that what it is? Yeah. yeah. $200. Okay, I'll, I'll move. I'll okay, Councillor Merlihan moves in a seconder. Yeah. Councillor McMillan, all those in favor? That's passed. Thank you very much. December 3rd, right? That's correct. Hope to see you all there. Okay, thanks. You may turn your microphone off and your video off. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Our second 9.2 delegation is zone change application for um, tube line 6455 Reedwoods Drive. Before we hear from the register delegation, Mr. Vink will provide council with an overview of his report. Please go ahead, Mr. Vink, when you're ready. Thanks again, uh, Chair and members of Council. Uh, as Matt noted, this is for the property known as Tube Line, as our numbered company, uh, for the property at 6455 Reedwoods Drive and 6919 Line 86. This is zone change application 7 2022. Uh, it's a 7.3 hectare property that's on the westerly edge of the township. It's designated in the countryside land use area or prime agricultural lands in the township's official plan and is zoned agricultural site specific provisions, uh, permitting the existing farm equipment operation with some regulations around uh, on the existing operations that are there today. Uh, the applicant is proposing uh, to amend those site specific zoning regulations to 
um, re remove the restrictions uh, related to the building sizes that are currently in place and to remove the restrictions with regard to the maximum area of operation, which is currently seven hectares and reduce the number of required parking spaces from 280 to 140 parking spaces. The existing house that's on the property that uses the driveway off of line 86 is proposed to be removed along with the accessory buildings that would allow for the expansion for an approximately 10, 000, just under 10,000 square foot new building um, for the associated with the agricultural, agricultural operation. A uh, public meeting was held on this uh, back in September of this year. Uh, with regards to the actual application itself, just to, uh, regards to the provincial policy statement, staff is satisfied that the proposal is consistent with the provincial policy statement and the places to grow. It is also consistent with the townships uh, and regional official plans, which allow for minor expansions to an existing longstanding industrial use on an agricultural property and allowing for changes of that to take place. Uh, the applicant submitted a number of reports to us, one of which was a compatibility report related to noise. Um, so there is a noise study that was completed and determined that noise from the site can be mitigated with a few basic items that can be addressed at site plan. Those items are a bit of a, a small barrier, an acoustical barrier, um, some acoustical barriers around some of the air units, as well as some grading and drainage uh, grading items that be taken place, all which can be addressed at the site plan process. Um, there are no dust or odor issues related to this, this operation that's existing. They also submitted the functional servicing report addressing how water, stormwater, and sanitary issues will be addressed. Uh, stormwater will be addressed on site using the existing outlet with stormwater facilities. Water will be through an exist through a well. Um, they've provided detailed information how that will not impact adjacent properties, including the neighboring property to the south. And the sanitary will be for private sanitary, which will also be to the actually more to the north side of the site, nowhere near the adjacent property residential unit, the nearest residential unit to the south. Um, they also submitted some information around traffic as part of the planning report, just to note that there'll be some increased traffic and that will be taken using Reed Woods Drive to access the site. Uh, it's a minor amount increase in traffic and not substantial from what's there as it operates today. They are unable to use the access off of line 86. That will actually be closed. Uh, the region requires that that access off of line 86 be closed because it's an unsafe access for this type of operation um, given the curve of the road in that location. Archaeological report was also submitted and identified no issues. Based on all of those, town staff is satisfied that the regional and township official plan policies have been met and the use is appropriate. With regards to the actual site specific zoning itself, um, Removing the restrictions related to building size is not a significant concern. And uh, basically by tearing down the house and the residential air, uh, residential accessory building that gives space for this new building. And it would all be contained within the site as it exists today. The existing site is 7.3 hectares. The current zoning talks about seven hectares. So that's just allowing them to expand into the area the house is and just utilize the entire property as it exists. The biggest item basically is the reduction in parking and staff reviewed that um, based on the fact that the type of equipment they're manufacturing is large agricultural pieces of equipment. They don't have as many staff as maybe some industrial operations would have with smaller manufacturing of, of a smaller equipment. And they also don't do shift work. So there's no overlapping of shifts to take place that means when you need double, almost a double the parking to take place. Um, but it is a rural site, so therefore we got to make sure parking is provided. So um, staff has no concerns with the reduction of parking based on their projections, the number of staff they'll be needing, but we'll, we'll have provisions in the zoning to ensure that parking is adequately provided and protected. If need be, they could provide additional parking on site and remove some of the on-site storage. Further, just to some other items staff noted that we're just gonna recognize a display area for some of the equipment that's manufactured on site. So that's recognized in the zoning, as well as a retaining wall that's close to line 86 to recognize this relatively high retaining wall, which is a drop down from line 86. So you won't actually see it, it will actually drop down. Um, uh, just also, um, in terms of the noise, there's a current requirement in the current zoning bylaw that speaks to noise around areas of operation. Technically, we can't re regulate noise in the planning and the zoning, so we're going to remove that element and noise will be addressed through the site plan process as noted in the study that was completed. So there'll be noise restrictions uh, elements put in place to reduce that noise to the adjacent property, so there should be compatibility would be addressed appropriately. 
Uh, there was public comments at the public meeting and staff just noted these here, what the comments were and went through them. It dealt around scale, compatibility, conflict, snow storage, stormwater runoff and impacts to the well. Uh, staff reviewed all those issues. Uh, compatibility has been addressed, so there's no concerns that way, especially around the noise and will be finalized. During site plan, we will continue with some uh, tree planting and fencing to minimize any of those impacts as there might be just to make it more compatible or just make it a little easier to absorb. Um, in terms of snow storage, there's plenty of room on the site and there won't get, shouldn't get anywhere near the adjacent neighboring house, which is about 60 meters away and shouldn't go onto their property whatsoever with snow storage. Uh, as noted, there's sufficient well water that should be available. It's basically for the site for washrooms. They don't use water in the process. It is a dry operation, so there should be no impacts to neighboring wells. And the septic system is far enough away not to impact the neighboring adjacent well and well exceeds the building code requirements in terms of the separation between wells and septic systems. Uh, overall, staff is satisfied that these all, all these elements from the neighbor can be addressed through the, through sites, through the site plan process or through the zoning. Um, as I know, the site plan will follow up after this process and be the next step in the process after this. The draft bylaw is attached and we're hoping that can get it passed and approved tonight and we can move this application forward and support the business uh, in, in this township and helping them to produce and expand. Staff is available for any questions and the applicant is next is the delegate speaking to the application. Sorry. So thank you, Mr. Vink. Council, are there any questions for staff? Seeing none, uh, we will now hear from the consultant for the application, Brian Schantz. Mr. Schantz, you have seven minutes. Please turn on your microphone and video and begin when you are ready. Good evening. I'm Brian Schantz from Brian Schantz Limited and Facet Design Studio in Waterloo. We are the authorized agent on behalf of the owner for this application, 7-7. 2022. Uh, I'm not bringing forward any new information. I'm just uh, stating that tonight that on behalf of the owner, we have read the staff recommendation for approval. We've reviewed items, numerous items with staff getting to this point, and we are simply here that uh, to note that we can answer any questions that may arise. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions for uh, Brian Johns? on this application. Uh, Councillor McMillan, go ahead. Yeah, maybe not for Mr. Sean, sorry, it might be for staff too. Um, during the public meeting uh, phase of this, there was a delegation that was a neighbor. Um, I see that they're not here tonight. I'm, I'm just curious if, if their concerns were alleviated through the process. Um, for you, Mr. Cotton. To, to, to Council McMillan, uh, to the chair. So um, staff did chat with them prior to the public meeting and discussed a number of items as well as we listened to them at the public meeting. The staff went through and extensively addressed their concerns in the report and this report was shared with them so that they're aware of how staff was gonna be proceeding. Uh, we did not hear anything from the applicant, uh, from that neighbor uh, as a result of all this. So we are hoping that they're satisfied or items will be addressed appropriately with to their satisfaction. Excellent. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none. Thank you, Brian, for your input this evening. Um, you may turn your video and microphone off again and, and go to the trick-or-treaters. Um, I will now ask uh, Clerk Smith if there are any unregistered delegations in the meeting for this report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, there are no unregistered, unregistered delegations. Okay. Thank you, Clerk Smith. Um, now, council will now discuss and debate. Council, is there any further discussions or questions for staff? And there is a recommendation at the end of the report. Councilor Schantz? I just moved the application. Do I have a seconder? Councilor Martin, any other questions, comments? All, all those in favor? Uh, that's passed. Thank you very much. Uh, Clerk Smith will go. Oh, no, here's. Uh, Councillor Merlin is back. Okay. Let's go number 9.3, zone change application for Nomadic Elmira Towns Limited, 15 Barn Swallow Drive. We have Mr. Gundrum again, again, to provide council with an overview of his report. Go ahead when you're ready. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor and Chair Redekop. Uh, <clears throat> the following application before you tonight for uh, consideration is zone change application 6 2022 uh, by Nomadic Elmira Towns Limited. Uh, to remind Council, a public meeting was held pursuant to the Planning Act on May 30th, uh, 2022, uh, to consider uh, the, the subject zone change that would apply to 15 Barn Swallow Drive. Uh, the subject property is a corner commercial lot uh, that is currently vacant and bounded to the north by Church Street West and to the west by Barn Swallow Drive. Uh, it abuts residential properties that predominantly contain singles attached units to the south and east uh, that front onto Bristol Creek Drive as well as Rob Road. Uh, subject property is approximately 0.64 hectares in size and is designated as a residential and ancillary land use in the township's official plan and is currently zoned convenience commercial C-4A uh, with site specific zoning as well. Um, the applicant is proposing to place the subject property within a site specific R7B zone uh, that would allow for a mixed uh, commercial residential site consisting of a two story mixed use building having commercial uses on the ground floor as well as six residential apartment units on the second floor with the remainder of the site to be developed with 45 uh, residential units in the form of stacked uh, townhouses. Uh, the original, I'll note for uh, council that the original application submission also requested to amend the township uh, official plan uh, to allow for an increased net residential density of 81 units per hectare, whereas the official plan at the time only permitted an upper limit of 60 units. Uh, subsequent to uh, the application submission and the previous public meeting, the new township official plan, which was adopted, uh, now permits an allowable maximum density of up to 120 uh, units per net hectare on the site. Uh, therefore, the uh, previously requested uh, township uh, official plan amendment is no longer uh, required. Uh, following the public meeting that was held May 30th, uh, the applicant's agent, uh, uh, Patterson Planning Consultants, uh, provided a comprehensive response to township staff concerning all comments received uh, from members of the public as well as from public agencies, uh, as well as township council and township staff. Uh, the applicant's agent has provided a response under separate cover to address uh, ex more explicitly council's concerns that re regarded uh, the reductions in available commercial development uh, potential for this area of Elmira that would result out of the proposed uh, zoning change. Um, in addressing that, uh, Council's concerns regarding proposed reductions to commercial space, uh, the applicants provided formal correspondence from two professional commercial leasing companies, which indicated that the suggested limit is appropriate for satisfying local demand in their professional opinion. It is also noted that one of the leasing companies that provided formal correspondence acted as the listing uh, mark and marketing agent for the subject property uh, for a period of one year, which ended in May of 2019. Uh, the applicants also provided a uh, functional servicing and stormwater manager report, which has been reviewed by township staff as well as region, regional staff. Uh, the report concluded that post-development stormwater flows will be less than pre-development flows based on engineering design. Uh, the report also concluded that sufficient water capacity, fire flow capacity, and capacity for sanitary Treatment flows are present to support the proposed development. Uh, regional staff, uh, as well as township staff, expressed no concerns with the report findings. Uh, also concerning traffic impacts, a uh, professional traffic impact study was completed, which has been reviewed also by both township and regional staff, uh, concluding that no um, upgrades to the local road network would be required uh, to accommodate the additional traffic flows from the proposed uh, development. Uh, regional staff have indicated that they generally concur with the study recommendations and that no improvements to the local road network uh, are would be required. Um, <clears throat> I will uh, note that um, to ensure that the site concept design as put forth by the applicants is implemented as presented, uh, the proposed uh, draft zoning bylaw amendment text has been crafted uh, to include minimum and maximum building line setbacks from abutting streets, uh, such that the general position and orientation of both the stacked townhouse units that would be located to the south of the site and the mixed use residential commercial building located to the north of the site 
are in fact uh, located uh, generally uh, as the concept uh, that has been provided to the township uh, uh, describes. Um, the draft uh, zoning and bylaw amendment text also contains provisions to limit the amount of commercial development and provides definition and provisions related to stacked townhouse units uh, to ensure that the envisioned uh, mixed, use, mixed use nature of the site is implemented as proposed. The noted parking ratios for the respective commercial and residential units are also explicitly stated within the draft amendment text. And I will note uh, for council that there was a uh, slight revision uh, to the draft amendment text as it relates to the parking ratios uh, for, for the uh, commercial um, component of the site uh, to ensure that um, the uh, noted total number of uh, parking spaces as provided on the concept uh, ca uh, can be uh, provided uh, and that there'd be no ambiguity in terms of interpretation as to how uh, the ratio and therefore number of spaces for the commercial units are in fact arrived at. So there was a slight uh, alteration that was to um, point uh, 4IG uh, of, of the amendment text and that was shared with council earlier today uh, following consultation and agreement with the, um, uh, with the owner's uh, planning consultant uh, prior to the, uh, the meeting tonight. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, planning staff have found uh, that uh, the proposed zone change for 15 Barnswell Drive zone change application 6-2022 has been found to be consistent with the provincial uh, policies of the provincial policy statement, place to grow, uh, the region of Waterloo official plan, as well as the township official plan. And I will note for members of council that the proposed development uh, also um, is in keeping and supportive and consistent with the concept of a 15 minute community whereby uh, the site will provide for service commercial uses in proximity to where uh, both current and future residents will live within the town of Elmira, um, and therefore allowing for a more uh, compact um, urban design that provides services in very close proximity to where people live. Um, so again, staff are recommending that um, uh, council uh, approve this application and I will end my comments here. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, are there any questions for the staff? Concerning this application, Councillor Merlihan, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> through you to uh, David. Uh, I know there's probably quite a few residents out there uh, wincing, uh, as you said, that um, the traffic study uh, would have no bearing on uh, current traffic conditions. Um, you know, we hear that about other subdivisions that come online as well, that there will be no bearing on traffic. Anybody who has to leave Elmira at certain times of the day would probably disagree strongly with that uh, sentiment that uh, there aren't any traffic problems associated with uh, uh, with adding new developments. It would be nice if, uh, you know, that we had a region that was more responsive to uh, fixing some of those traffic issues. Uh, and, uh, you know, that is slowly happening. But these uh, subdivisions will all be online long before uh, anything will happen there. Um, I guess my other uh, problem uh, it still remains the uh, commercial aspect of this particular spot. Uh, the township spent, uh, you know, si significant money uh, doing uh, official plans where at one point in the past, they looked at this place as a, a potential uh, area for commercial. I'm wondering if you could uh, talk about what planning staff to, did to verify the study, the self-study that was done by this uh, particular group uh, to say that uh, the commercial development was uh, not able to happen. Um, I would be greatly concerned if uh, we had all these reports every time a, a developer wanted to do something different with a property and they just said, well, we couldn't uh, make a, a go of the commercial, so we want another one. Here's our study that we did ourselves. Uh, everyone in Elmira should be concerned that we won't be able to attract uh, any kind of commercial development because, well, the developer said so. So can you please uh, uh, tell us what, uh, what township staff did to verify the accuracy of the report 
that they gave you? And does our economic development officer concur that uh, finding uh, or finding tenants for leasing commercial spaces uh, near impossible in Elmira? Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Merlihan. Through the chair, to address the first point about traffic. Um, there was a this there was a professional traffic study um, completed in support of the development, and again on the basis of what this development proposes to provide for, um, it, it didn't find that any upgrades uh, in re specific response to what's proposed to be constructed on the site would necessitate any upgrades to the local road network. That meaning the road networking immediately uh, in the vicinity of, of the proposed development at this time understanding that, you know, it can't account for uh, other lands in the vicinity that are, are currently not, on, not under any kind of form of draft plan approval. Um, um, so that, that's to address the first point. Second point about uh, the commercial aspect and, and, and the potential loss of commercial space uh, potential that would occur. Uh, again, we had, we had two, uh, the, the um, letters that we had received were from two uh, professional commercial leasing companies, one of which being CBRE. Um, one of the letters was from a commercial leasing company, which had had the um, subject lands on the market for a period of one year to try and attract commercial tenants, and they were unable to um, to attract a sufficient interest to fill out the site uh, to make it viable for for total commercial development. So, I, I mean. The, these letters that we received are from pro professional companies that do this day in, day out. This, this is their business. This is what they know. This is what they live and breathe. Um, and, you know, we, we have to put some confidence in what we're, we're reading because these companies are putting their own professional reputation on the line with what they write to us. So um, we are the consulting planner who, uh, who provided this application on behalf of the owners uh, supplied those letters and has, has put his own um, confidence in, in what they say. And um, on that basis, um, we, we found that to be a sufficient response to those concerns. And, it, and although this site will still have a commercial component to it, um, allowing for less commercial development on this site versus what may have been envisioned in the past, uh, doesn't mean that there is there's um, we're we're cutting off any other opportunities for commercial development within the wider area within within the vicinity of where the site is located. And I, I've noted this at the public meeting previously that there are uh, two other sites in the vicinity that are currently commercially zoned that pro that will provide in into the future um, candidate potential for further commercial development in this northwestern. Uh, quadrant of Elmira. So um, that, that would be my response to those questions and concerns, Councillor Merlihan, and uh, I, I'll leave it, I'll turn it back over to the chair if, if uh, there's any follow-up questions or, or rebuttal to my statements. Do you have a follow-up? Yeah, follow Councillor up. Merlihan, go ahead. Uh, follow-up plus an, uh, an additional question on behalf of a resident. Um, I guess my follow-up is going to be just a comment. Um, you know, I'm going to just say that your answer was basically that you know planning staff just took their word and and did not uh, go beyond um, looking into whether or not uh, the site was actually commercially viable. Uh, I find that hard to believe that a site like that wouldn't be viable, uh, considering the the amount of growth that we have. Uh, depending on when that study was done, it could have been during COVID. Uh, it could have been all sorts of different things. I mean, when you don't have even uh, site plans and things for people to imagine what their business could potentially be in that space, uh, yeah, sitting on it for a year and saying, oh, we couldn't get anywhere, I, I don't buy it um, at all. Uh, but you don't need to respond to that. Uh, the question uh, that I have on, uh, there's a, a resident that backs on um, to, uh, to that property uh, on, that lives on Bristow Creek. Uh, he's concerned with the grade level. There's about, uh, he says, a seven to eight foot drop um, to his property. And he's concerned with uh, sight lines and, and, and such with the 
the stack townhomes that will become on his property. Is there any uh, plan to uh, mitigate any any of those potential uh, impacts on his property uh, in this plan? Uh, through the chair, Councillor Merlihan, to respond to those concerns about uh, privacy impacts uh, from, from the development to the neighbour onto Bristow Creek, um, this development will 100% have to go through the site plan control process, which will call for uh, mitigating measures to ensure that impacts from uh, parking, um, uh, 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 you know, new units, lighting off of the site, are mitigated and, and screened and buffered um, to the fullest extent to ensure that you know there is there is um, some protection for uh, for any offsite impacts. So there is a process to follow that uh, will address those concerns and attempt to address those concerns. Um, I will say that for the stacked towns that are located to the south, uh, that many of the units are inward facing to internal walkways and internal amenity areas and that many of the units have balconies that are and, and um, uh, windows and other viewpoints uh, for the new units that will face into themselves or across to the interior of the site or to the west to uh, uh, barn swallow. Uh, so I, that would be my response is that there is still a process yet to follow that would uh, more fully and more comprehensively address um, what those impacts are, how to deal with them, and how to mitigate to the fullest extent. Okay, uh, would I be able to? Uh, I'll forward the um, the resident uh, email. Then you would have it on file, and maybe keep them in contact with uh, when the site plan goes along. Is that uh, is that appropriate? Uh, through the chair, Councillor Merlihan, we'd we'd be happy to um, to work more closely with residents that have concern, although. The site plan process is a negotiated process between the township and, and the, the property owners or developer. Uh, we'd be happy to um, review those concerns and ensure that, that they were incorporated and, and, and taken into account during that process. Okay, thank you. Ms. Fries, you had a comment? Yeah, I was just going to um, basically state what David had just said, that the site plan process is an internal process, it's not a public process. So we can um, show the individual the plans and we can take their, their comments into consideration, but they won't be part of the whole site plan review process and won't be kept informed as the site plan process goes along. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions for uh, Mr. Goodendrum? Seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, we will now hear from the consultant for the application, Scott Patterson. Mr. Patterson, you have seven minutes. Please turn on your microphone and video and begin when you are ready. Uh, good evening, Council. Thank you for having me this evening. Uh, yes, my name is Scott Patterson uh, with Patterson Planning Consultants here on behalf of the proponent uh, being the property owner. Uh, just here tonight in full support of the staff report and recommendation. And I uh, would like to thank Mr. Gundrum for his diligence in reviewing this application. Uh, if there's any questions or concerns regarding the project, um, I'd be happy to try and answer them for council this evening. Okay. Any other uh, comments or questions to Mr. Patterson? Okay, seeing none, thank you, Mr. Patterson, for being part of your delegation. Um, I will now ask Clerk Smith if there are any unregistered delegations in the meeting for this report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. There are no unregistered delegations for this report either. Thank you, Clerk Smith. As there are no other delegations, Council will now discuss and debate. Council, are there any further discussions or questions for staff? We have a recommendation, but uh, Mr. Gunnar has amended it in his email to us earlier today. So that would be part of the recommendation. Any other, any comments, questions? I have a mover, Councillor McMillan, seconded by Councillor Martin. All those in favor? All those opposed? That was three to one. Thank you very much. Number 10 uh, on your uh, agenda item is consent items. Before we pass a motion to approve and receive the consent agenda as a whole, does anyone wish to remove any items for further discussion? 
Seeing none, uh, can I have a mover and a seconder for the consent items? Councillor Schantz, seconded by Councillor McMillan. All those in favor? Thank you. Number 11, staff reports and memos. 11.1 .1 memo, St. James Cemetery Acquisition. Manager of Projects and Operations, Thomas Vanderhoef is, is with us to provide council with an overview of his mem memo. Thomas, please speak when you're ready. Thanks, three Chair Reddick up the council. Um, so the memo before you this evening is regarding the transfer and acceptance of St. James Cemetery to the Township of Walsh by mutual consent. The cemetery is located just east of Elmira, conveniently across the street from Union uh, Cemetery, which is a, an active uh, township owned cemetery. Township staff were approached in 2021 by the church for requesting the transfer due to the inability of the church to continue with operations. Uh, the Funeral, Burial, and Cemetery Services Act requires the municipality to accept a cemetery in, in instances such as this. And a uh, positive uh, sp spin on this is the cemetery does have 450 uh, unused internment rights, so that will increase our capacity, which is good. And then lastly, financial impacts. Uh, the transfer will include the perpetual care funds from the church at approximately $46,000. And those will go into our perpetual care funds as well. And then $9,000 in maintenance funds is expected to, after the cost of the land transfer, which is the last piece. And staff do uh, anticipate an increase in our annual operating expenses in cemetery a budget to the tune of approximately $6,500 annually. With that, happy to take any questions from council. Any questions for Mr. Vanderhoef? No. Councilor Schantz, go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, through you to uh, Mr. Vanderhoef. Uh, I see there's a $34,000 uh, expenditure upgrade there. What type of shed are we talking about? Uh, are we gonna, uh, actually have equipment stored there? Yeah, through you, Chair Reddick, up to Councillor Schantz. So we have an existing shed at Union Cemetery across the street. Um, the floor has been replaced on it a few times, so we're, we're looking to do more of a garage kind of style building uh, in the same location. And we do store a tractor in that as well as a sod cutter and some other equipment as well too for our burial, so yes. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, there's no recommendation. So this is just part of the burial act, I guess, that we acquire it. Okay, thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Uh, next, we have an official plan update consultant selection. Mr. Vink is with us again to provide council with an overview of his report. When you're ready, go ahead, Jeremy. Thanks again, uh, chair and members of council. So this is, uh, for consultant selection to update our township official plan. As you're aware, the Planning Act requires the township to maintain our official plan current and keep it current. The region has started, has started their process and recently went through the first portion of their regional official plan amendment to update the Paul, some of the first three chapters about density and the number of population growth to bring us to 2051. So to start bringing ourselves in line with that, uh, we're looking for a consultant to take a look at moving the township official plan to bring us forward to 2051, not just in population, but there's a number of key elements that need to be looked at and reviewed and considered. So they will take us through that process starting in late 2022 and probably over to into 2024 before it's completed. There's various steps to be taken place and a lot of public consultation. So it does take a long period of time. Um, so we went through and did the RFP process. Uh, before you tonight, you have the proposal to award the RFP to NPG planning for the cost of $177,912 after the HST rebate. And so they can begin the project. Um, staff is here to answer any questions. Any questions for Mr. Vink, Councillor Schantz, and then Councillor Merlihan. Yeah, uh, through you to Mr. Vink. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, with the new uh, proposed Bill 23, is that going to affect anything? Is this going to be thrown out and uh, money, uh, or, or, or can we cancel the contract? Or how do how is that going to affect us? Good question. But uh, yeah, through you to the rest of council as well. It's at this moment, Bill 23. We're still trying to wrap our heads around everything and all the impacts. But this will not be a wasted project. It will still need to go forward. The way Bill 23 is written is 
the, from what we understand is the region will disappear as a planning entity and planning approval entity. And the region's official plan will become our official plan till we re repeal it or replace it. So we will need to come up with our plan with our policies and we still need to bring in the 2051 numbers for population. So it is still a project we will need to do. And in some essences is actually more prominent, it's more important that we keep moving forward because we will need to actually get this completed now without a regional governing document potentially moving us forward in the future. Okay, thank you. Councillor Merlihan, go ahead. Uh, thank you through you. More along the same line, um, there is a discussion that the uh, regional official plan that they just passed is uh, potentially uh, going to be ixnayed by the uh, the government. Um, I guess that I guess would then the township still consider going through this process when the regional official plan, if it's under dispute, uh, would be more or less the same official plan that they currently have if it, if it couldn't be passed. And we would be aligning our official plan with what their old one is. Is, is that not the right understanding uh, that I have? So uh, through you, through the chair yeah. to Councillor Merlihan. So um, I, we don't know what the province is gonna do with regions review of uh, regions first three chapters. And we'd hopefully, Hopefully they'll, they'll be approved because there was a lot of uh, support for them. Um, if they don't, what would happen mid next year is whatever regional official plan is in place becomes our official plan. Still that plan needs to bring us to 2051. Currently the regional official plan that's in, in effect today, that's uh, the, the current approved one from 2015 only takes the 2031. So regardless, somewhere along the lines, the township will have to deal with moving us forward to 2051. We as staff, as council, as a community, will need to grow and determine how we want to grow to 2051. Um, without the regional plan approval, it does make it a little trickier as that means the municipalities will have to sort out how we get to that split on who gets what in growth. Uh, I'm sure the province would give us direction or we would still be working with something similar to what the region's already done because there was a lot of work done from the regional level. So we'd be working with that information that's out there. So it still remains very prevalent and relevant that we move forward with our own official plan because we have to start planning the 2051 as per the Planning Act and the provincial policy statements. We need to grow to 2051, not 2031 any longer. Yeah, I guess as, just as a follow-up to that, so, I mean, would it be... Go ahead prudent uh, to, you know, wait a couple of months to see what happens with, uh, uh, with this before, you know, fully engaging uh, on, a, on a new official plan. Um, you know, I mean, if, if the province is going to pull the trigger, they're going to be doing it soon, sooner rather than later. Um, so I guess my best response to you, Councilor Merlihan and count the rest of council is, um, the initial first few months, like by the time we actually get started and have some pre-meetings, we're not going to get much done in 2022. We're going to have a few initial meetings. They're going to be requesting some information, a lot of background data collection. And then starting into 2023 is likely to start doing some public outreach and starting to build up some understanding from the community. So there's other elements of the official plan that have to be addressed. So there, we do need to take a look at our values and our goals and objectives as a community. All that can still take place and is needed to start the process early on in the process. So those kind of things won't change. Those values, goals, and objectives probably won't change regardless of what the province does because that's what the community values and the community's objectives. As we move along, by the time we get to mid next year, we'll have the direction and we'll be able to move forward more clearly, I'm assuming in the next few months. Um, so I don't foresee that as a stopping the reason to stop anything or prevent anything because we will in the first few months just be data collecting and starting public consultation and what which we need to put this plan together and bring it forward as a full-on new community again so okay. thank you thank you deanne did you have a, a comment to make 
Um, I think that Jeremy answered that question very well. Um, we will need to start with the official plan, uh, regardless of what happens with this new legislation. It will just change a little bit uh, what we need to include in our legislation, what parts of it are going to be appealable that are going to our official plan and what parts aren't. So this will just provide additional context, um, but it's still a very well needed project and we will have to start it sooner than later. Um, the legislation that's out right now, um, I think it's out for comment until the end of November and then a lot of it is, is going to take effect January already. So we don't have a lot of time anyway to, to wait for that. Thanks. Okay. Thank you for that clarification from both Jeremy and from Deanne. Any other comments, questions on that? There's a recommendation here. Uh, Councillor Schantz. I'll move the recommendation. Yeah. And a seconder, do I have a seconder? Councillor Martin. No other questions, comments? Call the question. All those in favor? Uh, that's three, four, all uh, against. Okay, that's passed. Thank you very much. 11.3, another bill from the provincial government, Bill 109, implications and changes. Next, we have Director of Development Services, Services Deanne Fries and Mr. Vink, with us to provide council with an overview of their report. Deanne and Jeremy begin to speak when you're ready. Uh, thank you once again. Um, try not to monopolize your entire evening. Um, so Bill 109 was the most recent changes up until a week ago. So um, the township staff have been working to how we're going to implement Bill 109. And Bill 109 was implemented in the province back in March of this year. Uh, well, it was put out for comment in March of this year and then passed by Royal Assent in April during the commenting period. So it didn't even finish the commenting period, it just was approved. So uh, one of the changes basically is that official site plans, zoning bylaw amendments and official plans have a timeline limit to them. And then after those timeline limits, essentially we have to start refunding monies back into the, to, to the applicants uh, who made the application. So for site plans, we are now going to be given 60 days to deal with the site plan application. For a zoning bylaw amendment, we're we'll given 90 days to deal with the application. And for an official plan amendment, we're given 100 and maybe associated zoning bylaw, we're given 120 days. So that's from when it's at, deemed basically complete to the day council makes a decision on the zoning bylaw and official plan amendments. After which, uh, there's a decreasing amount of funds we have to return. So initially, after those 90 days, let's say on a zone change, we have to immediately refund 50% of the monies back to the applicant. And then as another number of days go on, we have to result another 25. And then after another number of days, we give another 25% up to 100% of the fees returned. So obviously that has an impact on the municipality and our budgeting process. Um, so we do not want to lose funds and cost the taxpayers money. So we're looking at ways that also to maintain and meet those deadlines that the province is looking for us to achieve so we can move applications through in an ex expedited manner and so that they can get developments moving forward. So the question is how to do that under this new process in this time frame without refunding money. Um, in terms of site plans, just gonna start with those first. Um, site plans, currently we take them in through a pre-application, review them. They'll submit for a complete application. We will review that and kind of go through a review change and review change process for a few times, probably about three to probably two to three times minimum before the, the site plan agreement is entered into. And that usually takes us three to five months, depending on how fast some of the responses come from both sides. Um, a lot of times, I'm going to be honest, it's actually a lot of time on the applicant side to make changes as necessary. Now we have 60 days to do that. So um, we're still going to continue with the pre application process. The goal is that the pre-application will be more diligent process. There'll be much more work taking place in the pre-application process to achieve the best complete application that comes into us. And that may mean working with the applicant to provide more details, maybe kind of looking at some of the reporting information so that we get a complete, full, properly completed application uh, without needing to make many changes. Once it's in and, and deemed complete, um, it's likely we can't achieve full completion, full review of all the agencies and all the departments within the 60 days. So we're gonna move forward to a conditional site plan approval process. Whereas the actual site plan, um, the drawing that shows where the building is, the parking and those kind of configurations with setbacks would get approved with the understanding that they will address the other items such as grading, drainage, 
any road widenings, any noise study completions, things along those lines as conditions of approval. And they'll have a year basically to complete that and bring, to complete the site plan and then be able to start construction and go into building permit. So we're moving along those lines to a conditional site plan approval process. Um, ultimately, it does mean more work for staff for tracking this and put more work on top of us to maintain these files then as a result, because not everything's done at once. It may be piecemealed a bit over time. Moving forward with the zone change in the official plan process, which is a very similar. Um, as you're aware right now, we go through a pre-application process, then a complete public meeting, we go through and work with the applicant to address issues and return to council with a recommendation report. We usually do that probably in at least probably about six months, six to nine months on average, uh, generally speaking. Again, it depends how much uh, time it takes them to return back with comments, especially if we're dealing with peer reviews or we're talking a gravel pit, it's much longer, correct? Now we have 90 to 120 days, depending on the application. So how do we maintain that? So staff has provided an outline of how we would meet that timeline for the 90 to 120 days in the rec in the report, just to outline that. And essentially to achieve that, there's a number of things that have to take place. One, we have to ensure we have enough council meetings to get reports to council, the public meetings and reports back to council. So the large meeting breaks uh, just don't work any further. So we need to make sure that uh, scheduling is taking place that council has to meet regularly. Council could always cancel, cancel a meeting if there's no need for a public meeting uh, or recommendation report to come back, but we do need to keep regular meetings open for staff to bring back the reports in the appropriate time period. Um, also the consultant reports, uh, when they submit them, we again are gonna put a lot of emphasis on the pre-application to make sure they present really good complete reports to us right at the beginning, the very front of the zone change process. Um, as much as we looked at the opportunity for pre-approvals of these reports, that can't be done. Uh, we got a legal opinion um, that we can't require pre-approvals, but we will be maybe speaking to the applicants and finding ways to get them as far along as possible that they maybe are, in some cases, uh, reviewed already in turn by some agencies just to get them to look at them and see if they're satisfied with what's coming in in the actual application. Uh, another challenge is peer reviews. Obviously, if uh, under a current processes, we have time to do peer reviews. Right now, we're, with this new process, there wouldn't be time to complete a go out after the fact, after a public meeting, search for a consultant, and then get the peer review. So in order to achieve opportunity for peer reviews, staff is looking for council to allow staff to get a list of pre-approved peer reviewers that we could immediately solicit their uh, their, their resources once the application is in and deemed complete. So they would be reviewing the, app, the application for whatever reports we put in front of them uh, immediately once we receive the application and they would be giving us comments in time for the public meeting basically, like any of the agencies. And then working through that way. And then hopefully we get all the comments from all the agencies in and around the time of the public meeting to allow us to finalize a staff recommendation report shortly thereafter because with the staff recommendation report, we have to have time to get through the internal process of uh, managers, directors, reviewing the reports as well as senior management and then getting it to council. Um, so obviously we are we'll be looking to move it that way uh, to get those peer reviews in place early. Right after the public meeting, we would essentially also meet potentially be meeting with the applicant to talk about where things are. Um, if we have significant concerns, we might say there's a trigger here to say it, maybe it's time to withdraw the application and come back later, or discuss just how to proceed forward in the best manner to give the, to, within the timelines that we're looking at. Um, some of the reports also we'd be looking at trying to simplify the reports to make them shorter so there's less staff time in writing the reports so we can get them to you quicker and easier to hopefully hopefully get done um, another element is the report review process internally just to make it clear there is a timeline where we send it to smt and then before we get on to council if the timeline is short we might be bypassing the smt process and asking the cao to review and sign off to get it onto the council agenda that may become more more often if we can't hit the smt schedules uh, the other last element just around notice and uh reports is right now we have a an understanding of giving applicants two weeks notice when a report's coming back as a recommendation and that was started back uh, quite some time ago, probably in the 80s, when we used to mail the reports to the, app, to the, to the neighbors who were concerned. So they would physically get put in the mail and that's the only way they got a hold of them. 
Nowadays, we have everything, all the electronic opportunities, we put everything uh, out on the internet or we can email it to them immediately. So that two week time period isn't as important and we're, we're requesting that staff be given the opportunity to just eliminate that two week time period and just the same as council, they get it the weekend before or a few days before the meeting, uh, same as council gets the report and they can review and then determine if they wish to speak to council. Uh, just last, uh, this dealing with council decisions. Um, council, when they get the recommendation report, would have basically three options that we're looking at. One, to approve the application. One, to approve the application with a holding provision. And the holding provisions would be for technical issues, to say finalizing a traffic study or finalizing an, uh, um, a geotechnical study or something along those lines. They're very technical items. They're not going to impact the overall moving of the application itself, but they need, need to be addressed and finalized. And then the other last option would be to deny the application. So uh, there is not a deferral, isn't a decision. So council wouldn't be given the opportunity to defer unless council wanted us to start refunding fees back to the applicant. So a deferral is not a decision in that case. And as I mentioned, we are probably more likely to start seeing more holding provisions to be put in place to saying approved subject to addressing this report being finalized either to council's approval or it is, can now be delegated down to staff, which would be the director of development services through the delegation bylaw. Uh, we could direct things down to Deanne's position and she could approve a holding provision, a lifting of a holding provision. One of the things we wanna make very clear here though is because everything's getting very front loaded because we're trying to get a lot of things done and the best application to come in at a complete application, the public's perception of this, um, we wanna make very clear, it's likely the public is going to perceive this as a done deal when applications come in sometimes. Unfortunately, there's not much we can do with the time period we're working with, um, but we are going to be working with applicants in many cases, say to have them reach out to the neighborhoods, maybe even do their own pre app, their own public meeting with the neighborhoods. We are not, this is not a done deal process. Uh, the complete application is not a done deal. It doesn't mean that we're going to approve it, but it may be perceived that way. It may also be perceived by the public that this process is going very quickly when we're going in 90 days uh, for a zone change, for example. That's the unfortunate reality we have to deal with, but we just want to make it very clear that that's potential what's going to happen out of this is the public will kind of be disjointed and feel a little left out or just, or just kind of like they're rushed through the process and not being heard. That is not the intent. We hope that that won't happen in the end, but it may be perceived that way. Um, a few other things we have to do with Bill 109 is we have to track applications and we're going to be switching the way we track applications. We already did internally, I've been tracking them a little bit differently just from an internal perspective, but on the web page, we'll be changing things up and working with uh, a revised web page, hopefully by the end of the year, that would show where we are in the process with each application and when we anticipate coming back with a recommendation report. So that would be kind of outlining the steps. There'd be like a timeline on the uh, on the web page with the application where we list what reports are in or out have been received. So we'll be looking at showing that for the public so they know where things are proceeding. One of the last big things to talk about is planning application fees. Um, obviously there's different ways we could handle this to try and reduce the amount of monies we might have to refund an applicant uh, if the, we do have to refund them. So we did look at various options and opportunities in the end of the day, we're going to kind of go with the status quo of the way we've been doing uh, applications and collecting fees. The only change is kind of moving to the, because the, pre, the pre-application will be very front heavy process, we're going to move some of our fees there. So because there's more staff time on the pre-application. So those are non-refundable fees. Um, but and then we're going to be introducing a review for a complete application to make sure it's all done completed. There's a small fee for that. And then the application fees will drop because there's less work being done at the application process time because a lot of it was done up front. So there in the amount that we're re, 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 um, maybe refunding would be less also and less of an impact on any budget uh, if we do refund. Uh, one of those elements too is we are taking out the advertising fee. The advertising fee is gonna be separate because, and that's for our anything we do in the newspaper, mailings and the sign would be pulled out separately and would be non-refundable. Basically, we're trying to determine, make it very clear what's a refundable portion and what's a non-refundable portion. 
And those are, you're gonna see that in the fees and charges bylaw, which is coming up next actually after this report. So those, that's how the fees and charges have been broken up for uh, site plan, site zone changes and official plan amendments. So you're gonna see some dramatic changes there as to how those are looking in terms of fees. So overall, um, it's a transition. It's gonna be a lot more work for staff. It's gonna be a shorter time period for staff to deal with these things, a lot of work more up front. Um, we look at this though as an opportunity to try and work with the consultants and try to get the best things done in a short period of time and move applications through in an expedition expediently. Um, that helps us as, you know, as a community to see growth and development take place appropriately and without dragging out the process. In front of you, you do have the recommendation that includes that the site plans be completed within the 60 days and then staff move forward to conditional approvals. Uh, that corporate services, the clerk's department, ensure the draft, that the council calendar uh, ensures adequate meetings for the council to deal with these applications that come forward. That we be the opportunity to move forward the pre-approved peer review list uh, to prepare terms of reference for some of the studies that we be doing so that the applicants are very clear of what our expectations are for when they submit. Uh, that recommendation reports be modified to more simplified standard format process of providing the report to interesting parties be amended to remove that two week notice before the recommendation report is brought back to council. The fees uh, be adjusted as per the fees and charges bylaw to maintain the sort of the status quo approach. Uh, additional fees be added for the uh, removal of holding provisions and the completion of the uh, complete application review. And to include the recommendation uh, to delegate the release of the holding bylaw to the Director of Development Services where deemed appropriate. And staff would bring forward a report to amend the delegation bylaw accordingly and to implement the planning application tracking process. Uh, I'm here to answer any questions. I know I kind of summarized that fairly, although it took a long time, fairly quickly. So willing to answer any questions that council has. Any questions for Mr. Bink? Councillor Merlihan. Yeah, thank you through you. Uh, it's more, um, I guess, a comment. Um, some of the changes that I see for the planning that, that you're looking at actually look like good good changes uh, that will um, benefit, you know, overall planning in general. The timelines being very transparent about how things happen, uh, you know, all seem like uh, good things. Um, I remember when we talked about this issue when that housing report came out and, you know, I was trying to sound the alarm that this was going to have huge implications on our township. And sure enough, here we are not that long ago talking about the huge implications uh, that that uh, initial report that was floated out uh, by developers and real estate agents uh, made its way into uh, government. Um, so here we are uh, talking about that now. Um, I generally, um, you know, I'm I'm fine with how uh, staff has uh, has looked at the issues and and you know been somewhat creative in how to minimize uh, the impacts. Uh, I'm just wondering, I guess, the uh, raising the fees and putting them in different areas is 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 that going to be a common practice, or is that um, like is that something that other municipalities are also doing to minimize those uh, refundable fees? and uh, or whether or not this is just something that uh, Woolwich uh, got clever about. Uh, through you, uh, to the chair, to Councilor Merlihan. So we did correspond with the region, uh, other municipalities in the region. Uh, we had a number of meetings with them to talk about opportunities and solutions. Uh, I would say Woolwich is one of the furthest ahead in determining what way to go and where to go uh, with a plan at this point. Wilmont is fairly close along with us at this point in time, and they're very similar. So they're looking at things in a very similar way as we are. Um, the bigger cities, obviously, um, what we're understanding from the cities, I think not just Kitchener, Waterloo and Cambridge, but other cities across the province are basically, they're not in the position to react like we are. And it looks like they're, they're looking more at the fact they're gonna have to refund a lot of money. Uh, they know they're not gonna hit timelines and they just know they're going to be funding and they're trying to work around ways um less some ways they are thinking about is different ways of like just working with the applicants and maybe not refunding them immediately things along those lines which uh, our legal opinion was a little different uh, which said we couldn't really do that 
So we're trying to find the most legal approach and the best approach. And I think it's it's some that other municipalities will be implementing too and moving forward with. And as you noted, yes, it is beneficial, I think, for everybody in the end of the day. We are starting to try to work that way already with some of the applications in front of us in the last few months as to how quickly can we process them appropriately uh, within these time periods and does it can we make it happen? Um, the creativity around the fees, just to realize, although there's some slight increase in the fees, for the most part is a juggling of the fees. So we moved much of the monies up to the pre-application and we took money away from the actual application fee side. So it, they didn't raise, you know, in total, they probably went up about a thousand dollars because there's less, lots more staff time going forward with some of this, but um, we didn't go substantially overboard and are still maintaining fees that are consistent with other municipalities and much less than some of the bigger cities, for example. Okay, can I have uh, another question? Yeah, go ahead. Um, as far as, um, oh, what was I gonna say? Uh, oh boy, I lost that one. Okay, so anyway, I'll go with my comment. Um, I did have a good follow-up, but uh, anyway, my comment, um, uh, I don't know if it was in the past year or maybe it's two years now, you gave counsel, uh, Mr. Vink gave uh, counsel um, a demonstration of uh, what a planner is involved with um, every time you go. You had big stacks of these are the reports and this are the things. And I guess my comment would be um, that presentation was helpful for me. And I, I, I think it would be really helpful for the, the new council to get that understanding right away um, as to what it is that planners do. And if you did it on a public Zoom meeting here, then it would be an opportunity for the public uh, to see what it is that that uh, the planning departments are, are dealing with, the amount of reporting, um, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and I think uh, that would be an, a, a great opportunity to, you know, you, you mentioned in your, in your report that or in your talking that the public perception is that everything is a done deal. And um, <clears throat> anyway, I, I, I would encourage uh, you to give that presentation to the new uh, members of council. I remember what my count, my, my uh, question is, and it was basically uh, your recommendation doesn't look at uh, extra staffing at this point. Is that, uh, is that something that is coming down the pipe? Um, um, Ms. Free, do you want to answer that question? Um, I think we recognize the fact that uh, all of these changes, plus the additional changes to come, they will result in a large impact to staff. Um, and with a really limited planning department that we have right now, it's going to be very difficult to continue with just the same staff level. Uh, there's a lot more work associated with just even taking reports to council to just get a holding, then go back and do more work and then go back again. You're adding additional steps for staff and you're adding a lot, addition, a lot of additional work up front. So um, I would say that staffing will be an issue in the future. Okay, could I put one request in for the future? Uh, whoever planning, uh, more time dedicated to the Heritage Committee would be um, appreciated. Uh, so we got a uh, little bit more uh, work done on that end. Um, but that's just a, a, a quick little plea. Okay. Anyway, thank you. thank you. Did you have anything else, Ms. Freeze? You had come on a little earlier. Um, you... No, the only other thing that I just wanted to say uh, through you, Mr. Chair, is that we are working with the other planning heads for all the other municipalities. We're trying to align as much as we can, but there are very different um, circumstances in the cities versus the township and different townships, but depending on uh, their staffing levels and what they have going on. But we do have ongoing meetings to uh, discuss Bill 109 and I guess now also Bill uh, 23 as well to try to align as much much as we can. Uh, we know that these new changes that are also just coming out that were just announced this week that will also have more changes to how we process and, and uh, um, the procedures, the internal procedures for planning applications. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions for either Mr. Vink or Ms. Fries? Uh, Councillor Bouchance, go ahead. Uh, thank you. I have a number of, I guess, questions and comments. Um, first, I, I one of my questions was uh, what Councillor Merlihan asked about staff, and I was concerned about that. But I guess I, one of my concerns is the uh, speed at which we're doing this, and how do we clear the backlog that we probably have? I don't I assume that all your desks aren't empty waiting for this. So it's, there's going to be a catch-up period, I would imagine. And then, uh, then when does this start uh, 
happening moving forward. What's the date on that? For you, Mr. Chair, to Councillor Schantz. So um, everything that's existing in the queue isn't subject to the refunds. So as a, a, everything submitted before December 31st of 2022 is under the current process. Anything submitted as of January 1st, 2023 is subject to these new process regulations in terms of refunds. So um, we will continue to work with anything that's backlogged. Uh, there, I wouldn't call it backlogged, anything that's in the works. Um, so there are a number of applications then they're still being worked on and we'll hopefully try to get them wrapped up in due time as, as they can with the applicants. Um, but yes, obviously it's going to change things starting forward in 2023 that we'll have to start trying these new, these new applications will go forward in a little faster fashion. And then if I can continue on, go uh, ahead, chair. Um, so what is the incentive for the applicant to come back with the, the information that you need? Um, you say you already say there's kind of a disconnect there already. And what is the incentive if I'm an applicant? And I know I'm going to get 50% back if I drag my feet. What? How? How can we? Uh, how can we stop that from happening? Um, yes, through your chair to Councillor Sean, the rest of Council. Um, the the uh, the incentive here is that generally speaking, we don't want to be in the process of refunding the fees whatsoever. So our goal is that we will be coming back to Council with a decision. So our hope is, is that council will be making one of those three decisions to move forward. The incentive for the applicant is, is they don't want their application refused and restart the process because that's going to double cost them, right? Once you've got to restart, you're going back to square one and it's basically resubmitting. It's going to cost you money. So they don't want to do that and we don't want to do that. So that's why we have that trigger process right after the public meeting too, is to say with the applicant, what do you want to do? Do you really want us to proceed? and maybe refuse your application based on what we see going on, or how do we proceed so that we can get the decision, the best decision, the most informed decision in front of council uh, to move forward with at the time of the recommendation report. So the incentive here is for them to give a good application because they want it approved, not refused. Okay, so we have some control over that. Um, and then I, I also noticed that um, we do have uh, uh, peer review companies uh, suggesting that we maybe have two or three ones that we can count on um, so we can push them a little bit because uh, we hold the purse. What about uh, the region and uh, also the GRCA? How can we get them to, uh, to reply in a timely manner and uh, so we can move forward with these applications? Uh, yes, through you to the council again. Um, the bill, the changes, the recent changes that are coming out from the province are limiting the region as a as an approval agency for planning applications. So the region will become in 2023 uh, a region without planning approvals. So they will no longer be giving us planning approvals. They may, I'm not sure how it's going to work. Maybe they'll still give me comments, but they're not an approval agency. So they're not going to hold us up in that process. And the conservation authority comments are going to be scaled and tied back to what they can comment to. Um, so I'm, and generally speaking, the GRCA has been fairly good to work with and get us things on a timely manner. So, yeah, we can't control all the applications and how things are responded to. We can't control all the agencies because there are, there are some uh, provincial agencies like the MTO that we would have to maybe would challenge us. Uh, where we wouldn't get the comments back in a timely manner. From what we understand, they're not going to fall. We may not follow this timeline. So it may just make things a little more challenging as to how we proceed forward. And that's where we might work with the applicants that during the pre-application process, we maybe are able to get them through working with whatever agency, whether it's the GRCA or the MTO, uh, to get those approvals before they almost get those approvals completed before they submit. So there isn't that lag or that potential problem that we have to come to council with a refusal because there's an agency out there that hasn't given us comments to deal with it. Okay. And just a final comment. Um, do you see any issues with, uh, with this going so quickly that could cause mistakes and we miss things or do we have checks and balances in place that'll eliminate some of that. Uh, through the chair again to the rest of the council, our hope is our checks and balances are in place that have always been in place is review. 
So it's not one person. Uh, the department works somewhat cohesively. So obviously we have the director is always reviewing my reports and uh, I always review any of the planners reports and then the reports go through CAO and the SMT staff. So there is a lot of balances in that respect as other people are reading it going, how did you get there? Or what are the concerns or how did that get addressed? So it's not guaranteeing that everything's perfect, uh, but it, it, there are already checks and balances in place. Okay, very good, thank you. Any other questions, comments? Councillor McMillan, go ahead. Thank you, Chair, through you. Um, so the incentive, it makes sense that the incentive to the applicant to move things along is that the decision to, the decision, uh, or sorry, the recommendation doesn't go to council that they reject the application. Is there a concern that there might be an increase in OLT uh, um, oh man, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, appeals. Uh, appeal. Thank you. Holy man, that was gone. Um, OLT appeals. Is there is there a concern that there would be an increase in OLT appeals if we send it to council with a recommendation um, that it be denied? Council deny it, and then their course of action, rather than starting over, is to just appeal the decision. Uh, through the chair again to council, that is an possibility. We do realize that there is the potential for an appeal as in any case. Um, like I said, our goal is not to try and get there to that point either. Like I said, it's not as much as we also don't want to refund fees. We also don't want to cause, bring an application that leads us to an OLT because those are costly and time consuming projects to go with the OLT with, a, with an app to defend something. So that's where we would continue. Our goal is to still to continue to work with the applicant and the public to get wherever we need to get with the best decision in front of us at the time. So um, it's not going to guarantee that we won't get people who might try to bypass the process or might want to go to the OLT. Um, but I don't think many people, other people want to go to the OLT either. Let's be honest. Most applicants don't because it takes a long time to get through the OLT. It costs them legal and other planning fees and other expert fees. And that's that doesn't benefit them either. So, you know, I, I can't I can't say we won't have more appeals, but also ultimately, I don't think we want to get there. And nor does most applicants want to be in that position. And therein, why we want to work with them to get to the complete application that's good and to go through that trigger process partway through to go where are we going and what's the plan here because we want to move forward with a good application. And they might we they might withdraw for a time period, so reducing some of their potential impacts and fees, right? And we come back with a new application and restart the process rather than appeal. Okay, great, thank you. Any other questions? Not seeing any, there's a recommendation uh, in our report booklet, uh, a long one, uh, but uh, Jeremy worked us through it. Thank you, Jeremy, for all your work. Uh, is anyone uh, wanna move this recommendation? Councillor Schantz, a seconder. Councillor Merlihan, all those in favor? And that's passed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeremy, for a lot of work. Okay, we'll go to uh, uh, number 11.4 in your agenda, fees and charges. We have D Director of Finance and Treasurer, Richard Petherick, with us to provide council with an overview of his report. Go ahead, Richard, when you're ready. Super, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. So essentially this council is uh, fully aware fees and charges uh, form a very important part to our budget process. Uh, and this is no difference. We like to uh, present the fees and charges, any changes to them for the following year uh, as early as we possibly can because uh, any of the changes that are gonna be proposed actually help uh, influence uh, the revenue projections that are gonna be in the following year's budget. So there are a number of changes that are being proposed and they're outlined in this report, as well as the attachment, uh, the bylaws that are attached. And we have uh, staff here that uh, are here to answer any questions that council may have uh, on any of the changes they have in their fees. Any, uh, Councillor Schantz, go ahead. Yeah, I don't wanna keep flogging this horse, but uh, maybe this is for Deanne. 
Um, I noticed, uh, or I didn't see anything specific for the topsoil inspection. And I was wondering if that's under the additional field inspection per lot. Is that where, where I find that? Yep, that's correct. So we've added that additional inspection. If required, there is a fee to go with it. And that is the one. Very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Not seeing any right now. Uh, there's a recommendation in your council package uh, concerning uh, Richard's report. Uh, do I have a mover? Councillor Martin, uh, seconded by Councillor McMillan. Any other comments, questions for Richard or for anyone else on staff? Might be. Um, okay. Thank you. All those in favor? And that's passed. Thank you very much. Number 11.5, uh, Backflow Prevention Bylaw and Program. We have Director of Infrastructure Services, Jared Poupe, to provide Council with an overview of his report. Please begin when you're ready, Jared. Thank you, Chair Redekop, and through you to members of Council. At long last, we're able to present to this Council, so I'm quite uh, happy for the work that staff have done to be able to do this uh, finally, uh, to bring forward a backflow prevention bylaw and program. We have been deficient. I think the report uh, spoke well to, um, to the importance of this. Unfortunately, we are the only municipality in the region without that. And it has been raised uh, a number of times through inspections with the MECP, as well as our external uh, auditor um, from NSF. Um, the, uh, the benefit here and some of the challenges we, we've been dealing with is it's very labor intensive to deal with this. Um, most municipalities have um, dedicated staff to be able to do this. So uh, it, was, um, it was very important. We found a third party provider that really takes the brunt of the administrative side and really township staff then as we have been doing, even in the absence of a bylaw, we have been making that a requirement as part of the building uh, approval process. The challenge that is following up with certifications, these things are need to be certified annually. And that's going, we've, so we've created a bit of a backlog there where we have a number of industries with backflow. Um, and now we're going to have to um, uh, sort of start with our priority um, businesses and go backwards to, um, to ensure compliance, uh, assuming that the, uh, the, the bylaw will be enacted. But on a go forward, uh, we've created a method um, using the third party that, that the tracking there uh, will be dealt with through, through um, the third party uh, provider and BSI. And the township staff involvement really will be up front as it currently has been with, um, with building permit approvals and uh, operations staff in the event of non-compliance. And that would just take the form of notification letter indicating that they need to comply. If they're not going to com uh, comply, then service would be be terminated until such time that they were compliant. So um, in, in, in the short, that's essentially the program. And I'd be happy to, uh, to answer any questions council may have. Any questions for Mr. Poupe on this uh, backflow prevention bylaw? Councilor Merlihan, go ahead. I'll just move the recommendation as okay. is. Uh, uh, let's move by uh, Councilor Merlihan, a seconder. Councilor McMillan, any questions? All those in favor? Raise your hand. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, number 11.6 on your um, agenda. Stage two traffic calming Woolwich Street south of Breslau. We have Mr. Poupe again to provide council with an overview of his second report here. Thank Go you, ahead, Chair. Chair. And through you to members of the council, another uh, at long last. Um, I think uh, this council has been around. We implemented a traffic calming procedure in, uh, I believe it was 2015. And uh, this is uh, our first go around at implementing stage two measures. Woolwich Street South in Bresla has been a hot button item for a number of years. Uh, we have exhausted all stage one uh, uh, measures and uh, staff were then able to undertake a survey of the neighborhood uh, as per the procedure. It does require 60% uh, in favor. We've achieved that. And it does require council endorsement to implement stage two measures. Remind council that stage two measures are more permanent. It can involve curb bump outs. In this case, we are uh, looking at installing um, uh, what we call tabletops. And I think there was a good illustration here in the notification letter that went out. So we uh, we did um, get it. Uh, I think it's really uh, wonderful uh, that um, that Woolwich has very good responses to surveys. And this is uh, another example of that 80% of people did respond. Um, so I'd just like to highlight that piece and would uh, be happy to answer any questions council may have. Any questions for Mr. Poupe on this report? Councillor Schantz, go ahead. 
Just a comment and, uh, and a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, thanks for, for working on this. Uh, it's been a while since uh, I've been trying to get this to come to fruition for quite a few years. Um, and I hope that uh, the rest of council will support me in this. Uh, question I have is, um, who develops the stages? Uh, what happens in stage one? Is that the township or is it the region or is it the province? And then I guess to follow up on that is, um, have we uh, had any positive results from stage one in other areas or haven't we actually done any stage one uh, other than this location? Yeah, through you, Chairman Redekop, to uh, Councillor Shantz. Uh, the first part, it, it's staff. Uh, we did canvas uh, other area municipalities at the time of creating the procedure. And uh, I would say that stage one and stage two measures are ever evolving. Um, so we did uh, implement recently the uh, the knockdown bollards that have been quite successful. And we have implemented, we continue to implement stage one measures on a number of our hotspot roads. So we will see shortly, I'm sure, other stage two measures at other locations at some point in the near future on Woolwich roads. Um, but it, it really depends on, um, on a number of things. But I think the knockdown bollards are probably the best bang for our buck. Um, and they do work. We've been monitoring um, prior to them going in. We monitor while they're in and we monitor again after they've gone just to determine their effectiveness. So, um, again, it depends on the location. Uh, some it's like most uh, things when they come, they do, do have an immediate effect. And then over time, people get used to them and uh, you start to see speeds increase. Uh, so I think it's the, it's those areas where we try to exhaust those stage measures, stage one measures, sorry, and to see their effectiveness. And uh, if if people start to go back to their old patterns or old habits, then I think the stage two measures are warranted. And that's what we're going to start to see here. OK, and, and do you have any costs on those uh, bollards what it costs to maintain them and because I I see them destroyed in a lot of places a lot of them are regional ones that I'm seeing but uh, are they fairly expensive to maintain and and uh, a lot of work uh, through chairman Redicop to councillor Shantz uh, they're about two hundred dollars a bollard and that's all of the hardware so the one thing is it's the upfront in, uh, initial installation the bases all stay the same so I'm not sure what those flexible pieces that that tend to break are they're they're not that but it's a full cost of around two hundred dollars and I think those uh, those flexi pieces are are cheaper than that to uh, to remove and replace I've noticed on Benjamin Road for example that uh, some of them are damaged some of them get replaced some of them you know stay stay there but um, um, they're not that that costly to replace and we found that to be somewhat of a benefit. Okay, thank you. I'd move the, move the recommendation. Okay, there's no other do I, questions. Do I have a seconder, Councillor Merlehan? Any other comments, questions? Uh, Councillor Merlehan, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Um, through you, um, I guess uh, I can think of a whole lot of places uh, in Elmira that I'd like to see these raised uh, tabletop or raised crosswalks or whatever you want to call them. Um, so I'm glad that um, this is really the first stage two measure, as you mentioned, uh, in in the eight years I've been on council and traffic um, in any municipality across Canada is probably the number one thing that uh, local politicians hear from residents. So um, I, I think our the stages that we came up with and we did that in our I think the first year that I was a councillor 2015 or something like that we had that stages policy um, I I would I guess recommend that staff review that again uh, to see if we can make stage two uh, methodology practices uh, sooner than you know eight years uh, to uh, to get to that next stage it is uh it's pretty frustrating um not only for residents but for people that you know you look at these things and it's like okay if we did this that would work um it's kind of like when you you know we deal with the region on regional issues where it took 12 years to put in a crosswalk and it worked and that was what we wanted 12 years earlier and when we finally put it in it worked um so I, I would encourage any of the new council to uh, to maybe talk about the policy again and review it and see how it's working and see how we can get to these stages a little bit sooner. Um, but I'll support this uh, motion because I heard from lots of people about uh, that when I was in Breslau recently. So um, it's, um, I'm happy to see okay. uh, some things working now. Good. 
Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Councilor Merlin. Uh, any other comments? It's been uh, moved and seconded. Councilor McMillan, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. So the tabletops, they don't impact uh, snow removal machinery the same way traditional speed bumps do. I know that's the argument against a lot of speed bumps. The tabletops are, are easier on the equipment. Is that right? Through Chair and Red to Councilor McMillan, that's correct. I don't think any operation staff enjoy any kind of traffic calming measures that's permanently installed in a road system, uh, but certainly they are manageable for sure. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Call the question. All those in favor? Uh, that's passed. Thank you very much. And then uh, Jared's up again, number 11.7, uh, core asset management plan update. Go ahead, Jared. Thank you, Chair Redekop, and through you again to members of council. This is um, this is a mandated requirement from the province through on uh, OREG uh, 58817. It is a very good piece of legislation. Um, there are uh, milestone dating along the way. I'll remind council that uh, they did endorse um, our current consultant GM Blue Plan to help with the uh, deadlines for 2024, uh, which includes all assets that a municipality owns. So that is a tall task. This is, uh, I don't know how else to say it, this has been a bear. Um, it's been a real challenge for us to get here. And uh, I do want to apologize to council. We were late with this. Uh, we did um, not make the July 31st deadline. I am aware that a number of municipalities have not. I'm not saying that misery loves company, but uh, that is a fact. So um, I just want to to highlight that it is a, a very challenging exercise, but something that's very beneficial and something that we need to continue to put uh, resourcing and emphasis on. I think that there was a lot of information contained. Um, in, in short, you could probably summarize this, that um, it's, uh, it's a snapshot in time for a municipality looking at a number of things, looking at all their core assets in this case, which included roads, bridges, uh, all of our sewer systems and stormwater management facilities, and seeing uh, based on current levels of service, how they're performing, condition rating is very important. Uh, it's And the only way you can truly condition rate something is gathering data, then applying it. Um, the township has struggled. So a lot of our, our sewer systems are simply age-based degradation, which is a method. It is uh, viable, but it's not really where you get your value. Um, to say something is 100 years old and it's out of its useful life, I would just challenge somebody to go to Europe and look at thousands of year, thousand of year old structures and see how they perform. The Romans taught us that obviously concrete can last 100 years. So we have history. We don't have some history, say, for polyvinyl chloride piping. We don't know. We assume that it's going to last as long, but we don't yet know. Um, so I think that's some important takeaways from this is that we do need to spend time and resources on uh, this endeavor township wide. And uh, it is a living document and a snapshot in time. So I think that's important uh, for this council. This will be for future councils as well. Um, and it is a requirement of the act that council does endorse the plan. And we are required to report on a plan at minimum five-year spacing. Um, but I, I think that the uh, what we can share from an infrastructure services perspective, because we, uh, we actually uh, are responsible for all of the core assets, and that's almost a billion dollars worth of asset and replacement value, um, that was shocking to me, by the way, but um, I think it's important to uh, for this council to know uh, that we are committed to doing this. So year over year over year, when we do capital budget and planning, this is going to be front and center to what we're doing. And we're going to be determining those levels of service and being able to report to council, even though it may not be in a fulsome format like this. Um, just appreciate that this snapshot in time will change next year and the year after, even without that formal report coming forward. But um, I think that's an important takeaway as well uh, on, on this. But um, again, the endorsement of this is not hooking future councils. That's not what this is doing. It's again, a snapshot in time and you're endorsing that snapshot in time. Uh, I'm sure it was no surprise to anybody that we are underfunded uh, in a number of areas. Uh, I think that that is probably most municipalities. I think a good news story here is that our bridge and culvert program is actually relatively decent. So, you know, there is some, some takeaways here and there's always room for improvement. So I think with that, I'd uh, attempt to answer any questions council may have. Thank you, Jared, for all that work. It's amazing. Uh, any other comments, questions for Jared on this recommendation about our asset management, core asset management? Seeing none, uh, do I have a mover and a seconder for this uh, report? Councillor Merlihan moves it, seconder, Councillor Schantz. All those in favor? Thank you, it's passed. Thank you, 
Okay, number 12 on your agenda. Um, Mayor Schantz requested the following be read at the meeting and Clerk Smith will read her comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. Um, Mayor Schantz asked me to read the following. My apologies for not being able to attend in person this evening due to a series of personal events. I do want to extend my greatest appreciation to each of you as you move on to other activities. This has been the most unusual term with COVID derailing many of our hopes and plans, but for the most part, we got through the ups and downs with grace and professionalism. I thank you for that. Each of you have a passion for Woolwich and for the residents. Your respect was evident in the way you interacted with our people and with each other. I trust you will continue to provide leadership each in your own spheres. Our paths will cross again. Public service, especially an elected position, is not for the faint of heart. You stepped up and put yourselves out there. Thank you for your service. All the best in the future. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Redekop and fellow council colleagues. If I may, I would like to ask for you to grant me the latitude to address public as well as since this is my last meeting. I'd like to take this time to publicly thank the residents of Woolwich for providing me with the opportunity and putting your trust in me to serve you in this capacity for the past eight years. I would also like to thank my council colleagues and staff as we delivered, deliberated together and to the many Woolwich volunteers who are second to none. Being a counselor is a multifaceted job and then some. While some, some may only observe our works in council chambers, so much, work, so much more of our work is not visible and happens in council appointed committee meetings, as well as meeting with residents and businesses. I have truly appreciated these conversations, even the difficult ones in driveways, porches, community centers, farmyards and businesses, as we tried to resolve problems and or vision new advancements. I also want to thank each and every candidate that put their name forward this past election, whether elected or not. Most people do not realize the courage it takes to do that and the work and expense involved in running a campaign. So thank you for stepping forward. To the new incoming council elect, I wish you all the best. You are not going to please everyone, but I trust that you will do your best to serve your community. In closing, to everyone, everywhere, Please stop speeding. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Schantz. Anyone else from Council? Councillor Merlihan? Yeah, thank you. Um, just general comments. Uh, I wanted to, uh, I want to really extend my thanks to the public uh, for the past eight years for this opportunity to serve. I gave it my all uh, and uh, put my heart into uh, serving you and making sure that uh, all public spending uh, has been accounted for and justified. Uh, my biggest thanks really is to uh, to Woolwich Township staff. Um, when I started in 2014, I am a much different politician. Uh, now, eight years later, I've really come to appreciate uh, the professionalism and uh, expertise that we do have in, in Woolwich Township. Uh, you made my job easier. Uh, you were very responsive to uh resident concerns that came through me and i can't thank you enough uh for that uh due diligence i hope uh that you'll extend again that professional courtesy to the new council uh which i am very excited uh to see uh and see a new direction come for uh woolwich township uh, a lot of uh new faces uh, that I hope the public gives a, a nice little honeymoon period for them to learn their job. And, uh, you know, any help I can give to uh, in that regard, uh, certainly will um, extend uh, my phone number to anybody that uh, wishes to, to phone me about any kind of background information. Uh, but really, at the end of the day, I want to just thank uh, the residents uh, for giving me this opportunity it's been experience of a lifetime and uh and also to uh township staff thank you thank you councillor merlin anyone else councillor martin thank you i think larry said it well for me but i'd like to thank all the residents in the township for supporting me over these many many years um 
it's a lot longer than I intended when I got into this, <laughs> but that's just the way it works. Um, it's been great serving you, and I wish a new council coming in all the best, and um, enjoy yourselves. <laughs> Thanks. Anyone else? Councillor McMillan? Yeah, thank you, Chair, through you. Um, like everyone else, uh, I'd like to thank everyone who helped me get elected. Um, spent eight years serving the people of uh, Woolwich and Wellesley Township. So thank you to everybody who had a hand in getting me elected. Uh, thank you very much to council colleagues. It was, uh, you know, certainly an, an unconventional four years, but uh, learned a lot from everybody around this table and wish we would have had more time around the table and not uh, sitting at home. Um, thank you very much to the Woolwich staff, uh, your grace and expertise and patience with with me um, was always appreciated. And uh, I thank you um, as a counselor and also as a resident for the work that you do. And then uh, most importantly, thank you to the residents, um, everybody who pays attention and votes, or even if you don't, everybody who takes time to call email. Um, thank you. It was an absolute pleasure and an honor to serve the people of Woolwich. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor McMillan. I ditto everything including what you've all said. It has been a pleasure and an honor and a challenge to serve the residents um, of uh, Woolwich Township. And I appreciate as uh, uh, Councilor uh, Merlihan said about the professionalism and the exceptionalism of our staff. They answered all my emails in quick time and they didn't say it was a dumb question or you should have known that. And it was just a pleasure to work with them and a pleasure to be on council with all the rest of you. So thank you. Uh, we have a couple more things to do before we go home. Uh, number 13 is the bylaws. There's a resolution that the following bylaws in the hands of the clerk be read a first, second, third time, and finally pass that they be numbered as bylaw numbers 5522 to 66 2022 and that they be signed by the mayor and clerk and sealed with the corporate seal do i have a mover and a seconder councillor martin and councillor shantz all those in favor thank you that's passed and the meeting adjourns to meet again at the inaugural council meeting on monday november 28th 22 do i have a mover uh, councillor shantz councillor mcmillan all those in favor Thank you very much for all your work. We ended before 11, no, 9, 9.30, so that's good. Thanks a lot for all your work.